Kapsanu University, Malaysia on learning how to learn, a user guide to our memory. I am personally very excited to learn new tips and techniques on how to enhance my memory and capabilities, and I hope you all are too. So won't make this too long. Uh, finally, I want to thank Apple Go, uh, the international recruitment and the entire Sanoe team for making this happen. So without further ado, I hand over the floor to Apple. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having us today as well. So um, my name is Apple. I'm from the international office from Sanoe University. Let me just quickly go through with you the programs of the day. I'll be sharing a little bit on study abroad experience under Sunway University and how does it look like if you choose to study here with us. And of course, then we'll hand over to the um, professor here to talk about the programs of the day, which is learning to learn a user guide to your memory. And of course, if time permits, we will have a very short um, Q&A. You can also um, you know, feel free to leave your uh, questions for us so that we will be able to answer to you by the end of the sessions. And that will be the end of the programs. So I'm not too sure if you have think of study abroad. Okay, A lot of students, um, when they choose to excel their um, academic skills, um, the ultimate goal is always to study abroad to gain a, a very, very different study experience. And when you do consider for a study abroad, there are a few things that always come into mind. Um, where is the locations? Is the area safe enough for me to go around? Okay, especially like I'm a, I'm a lady, walk around in, in the streets, on, on the streets at night, is it safe? And um, will it cause my parents a boom? Okay, because if the cost is a lot, then I don't think my parents will be able to send me abroad. And of course, is there any scholarships being awarded to me? For as I've done a lot of, I mean, I have do a lot of um, things and I prepare a lot for my study. Okay, and I achieve a very excellent result. Will the university be awarding my hard work? So these are the questions that um, students will pop into their mind. And of course, studying here under Sunway, it's always not an issue because um, this is how Sunway City looks like. You can see here in the middle, this is where our university is located. This city itself is about 30 minutes away from the capital. Malaysia capital is actually Kuala Lumpur, so we are just 30 minutes driving from there. And we are 30 minutes away from the Kuala Lumpur International Airport. So right in between, we have our own city, which is very interesting. And um, this, uh, this campus itself is actually a city campus. And you can see, this is our campus. We are very proud of it, okay? And um, this is where you're gonna study if you choose to come to us. What is good about us is because it's a city campus that we have all kinds of facilities. We have our on-campus accommodations, which is just five minutes walking distance from the, um, from the residence to the campus. So you can see we have a canopy walk, which is a sky bridge. It connects you to the campus without you worry about um, how is the traffic. Uh, I have not been to Bangladesh before, but I've seen plenty of videos. I know Bangladesh has a lot of cars, you know, traveling from one place to another place um, could be dangerous, but for us, it's actually just by walking, okay? And we have our own sports facilities just straight in front of the campus as well. Next, what else is in the city? From the canopy walk itself, it's actually links to a shopping mall, where this is one of the largest in the regions, okay, and in the country as well. It will also connect you to the theme park. We have our own hotels, okay. And especially during this pandemic, I would say hospital has become one of the very important um, icon to everyone of us. So if you need a medical assistance, the medical center is just right next to the hostel that I've shown you earlier. And the most important thing is safety. Okay, for you to have a police station close by to the place that you stay is one of the additional um, I want to teach to you when you choose to study here with us. So we talk about the safety, we talk about, you know, having so much of facilities here under some way. And for us, it's also about the convenience being given to the students. We have the canopy walk, which you can see on the right hand side. It's actually the link bridge that connects to the whole city. So from one place to another place, you just need to use the link bridge. All, you know, today I just don't feel like walking, you can take a free shuttle bus. So the shuttle bus will take you around the um, whole city as well, okay, by schedule, and it's free. So these are all the additional um, advantage if you choose to study here in Malaysia and the Sunway itself. And of course, a lot of students must be asking, is it very expensive to study in Malaysia? You can actually take a look on this slide, okay? 
And then the slides that we have done in terms of the cost comparison for the tuition fee and living course, Malaysia as one of the most affordable countries compared to like Australia, United States, um, England, New Zealand, Canada, and Singapore. But um, one thing is that we always want to emphasize that um, Malaysia, well, um, we are, the cost is rather affordable, but we do not give out in terms of the quality being, um, being extended to the students. Just to study here understandably, you also be able to get dual certificates. Our partners are Lancaster University, one of the top 10 in UK, and also Le Cordon Bleu that's measured under the hospitality industry. So we have lots of programs offered under Sunway University. You can always refer to us or you can always come back to Edico um, Manga, uh, Edico Pathway. They will be able to share with you in terms of the details of the program. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over the floor to our Professor Hugh. Okay, to be able um, to talk to you in terms of the main topic of the day. Pro, I'm ready. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you, Apple. So um, if you can stop sharing your screen, yep. um, I hope everybody can see me. Good morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you now about the most interesting subject in the world, which is you and particularly your memory. Now, as you heard, I'm a psychologist, so I like questions, because questions are a great way to get you thinking. So, I want you to think, what's more powerful, seeing or believing? So is what's in front of your eyes more powerful than what is in your memory? Can you actually trust your memory? How far is your memory an accurate guide to what happened in the past? Do you know how to focus your attention? Because this is a really important skill, not just related to memory, but also to study success. How much can your memory hold? How much can you put into your memory? And how can you maximize your memory? So what are some of the things you can do to make sure that you remember things? So what's more powerful, seeing or believing? I want you to tell me, how many legs does an elephant have? It's not a trick question. I hope you're thinking of a number. And I'm guessing that that number is four. Okay, so in your memory, an elephant has four legs. So I'd like you to count them, please. Ah, so here we can see that your memory says there should be four legs, but your brain sees multiple legs and those legs keep changing places. So actually what's going on out in the real world doesn't necessarily reflect what's going on in your memory. So how far can you actually trust your memory? So the last time you went to school, how did you get there? Can you actually remember leaving the house? Can you remember looking onto the road? Can you remember what cars were coming? What people were walking down the road? Probably not, because your memory doesn't capture many of the details. So what did you have for breakfast? Only a few weeks ago. I'm sure you enjoyed eating at the time, but can you remember what it actually was? Or if we go a bit further back, what were you doing on Tuesday, the 4th of June, 2019? Well, anybody got any ideas? Any thoughts on what you were doing? Can you remember? I bet you can, because that's what was happening on Tuesday, the 4th of June, 2019. And now I've told you that, you're beginning to reconstruct your memory. So I've told you a piece of information that helps you start extracting, pulling memories about what you were doing on that particular day. But actually the first thing to understand is that your memory relies on accurate attention. So can you focus your attention? We're going to watch a very short video. 
And all I want you to do is to watch the team that's dressed in white and count the number of times they pass the ball between each other. Just be quiet and focus. Now, does anybody have any questions? If you've got any questions, of course, you can always ask me in the chat. And if you want to message me privately, you can do, or of course, you can message all of us together. So let's have a look at this video. This is an awareness test. So how focused was your attention? Were you actually watching closely? So first question, how many passes did the team in white make? Does anybody want to type into the chat and tell me? Okay, we've got 10, 14, 10, 12 or 13, yeah, eight, great. Some fantastically observant people. Okay, a little bit more difficult now. How many balls were there? Type in to the chat how many balls there were. Oh, I think a lot of agreement there. Everybody says there were two. How many people were there playing in the white team? Okay, everybody agrees. Pretty much there were four. How many people were there playing in the black team? Most people again seem to agree it was about four. How many people were wearing hats? A mm, bit more difficult now, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, some people don't know, but two, maybe three. OK, so you were all really focused. I'm really impressed. You were looking really closely. Did you miss anything? Was there anything obvious and important that I haven't asked you about? Okay, now I'm going to let you into a little secret, and that's got to be between us, because I know lots of people wanted to come to this session today, and maybe uh, if Educo are kind enough, I can run this session again. So I don't want you telling your friends what I'm about to show you. So watch carefully. Well done. Did you see the bear? There's the bear. So this is the first important lesson about your memory. You have a limited amount of what we call cognitive resources. Think of cognitive resources as the amount of space and energy that you have to think and to remember. Now we use these resources for what psychologists call selective attention. Selective attention means choosing what to look at, choosing what to listen to. Now we also have to use these very, very limited resources to filter out other stimuli. Now you can see here, I've got some names and some dates. So Cherry 1958, Levy 2005. For those of you who don't know, that means I'm talking about scientific research. So Colin Cherry in 1958 did a piece of research that showed that people can only pay attention to one thing at a time. And Levy did another piece of research in 2005 to show that if there's things going on around us, like for example, counting the number of balls, we miss the moonwalking bear because tracking the ball in the crowd takes a lot of our cognitive resources. And that means we don't see the bear, even though the bear was very obvious and very unusual as it walked across in front of us. Now, the more difficult a task is, the more resources you need to use. That's why when you're studying, for example, 
it's really easy to get distracted. Because if you're focusing your cognitive resources on learning something, the slightest noise, the slightest buzz from your handphone, the slightest noise outside is enough to distract you because your cognitive resources are already stretched. So the first thing is to think about using your cognitive resources wisely. Don't try and do too much. And just here is a common question I get asked. Is music good for your concentration? No. Music takes up some of your cognitive resource. If you play music to yourself while you're studying, you will not study as effectively. Now, I give a whole talk on study tips that actually expands upon some of the ideas we're going to talk about today. If Educo are so minded, I'd be delighted to come back and talk to you about how to do better in your exams. So now let's look at memory and cognitive resources. So your memory is like a bottle. At the bottom there, you've got a huge, huge space, your long-term memory, in which you can put huge amounts of information. But at the top, you've got your short-term memory. And that is very narrow, very small. And your short-term memory is the limit of your cognitive resources. And as you have just seen, if your short-term is focused upon a ball being passed in a crowd, you overload your short-term memory capacity, you use up all your cognitive resources, and you don't see the moonwalking bear. That's because your short-term memory can only hold seven plus or minus two things. So your maximum short-term memory capacity is up to nine chunks of information. So can anybody tell me in the chat how many chunks of information are there in that person's head? So just count the individual objects. That's the number of chunks. So one, two arc-shaped things. Yeah, two circles and four dots. So correct, there are eight chunks. Okay, so there are eight chunks. Here's the amazing thing about your memory. You can actually chunk information into smaller chunks. So now you can see I've taken eight things and I've made them into two things. Two smiley faces is much easier to remember than four dots, two blue circles, and two art shapes. So how does this work for real? How would this work when you were studying? So we're going to do another very short test of your short-term memory. I'm going to show you 23 letters on the screen. I want you to read the letters to yourself silently. Don't say them out loud. Just imagine it was like you were reading a book. You were studying some of your schoolwork. And when the display finishes, I want you in the chat to type in as many letters as you can remember in the correct order. Okay, are you ready? Ready to remember 23 letters? Okay, go. Wow, that was quick, wasn't it? So, how many letters did you remember? What were they? Okay, I'm seeing here most people are getting about five, six, seven. Yeah, S, S, U, Y, D, all yet. Yeah. Some people pushing up towards eight. Okay, eight, maybe anybody got nine, which is the top end of your short-term memory? Okay, you guys are good, I'm impressed. You've got good short-term memories. Now, let's look at this as a psychologist would look at it. OK, you can check here your answers. So most of you got S-U-Y-O-A. Right, you might remember S-U as Sunway University. Y as U. O. OK, I remember. A. Or you might even turn it into Soyo. That's a form of chunking. But let's do this exercise again. Again, 23 letters. Again, I just want you to read them. 
And where the display finishes, I'm going to ask you to recall as many letters as you can in the correct order. Because you guys are really good, I'm going to give you a much shorter time to remember those letters. So focus, are you ready? Time to remember the 23 letters, focus really hard. Okay, go. Okay, so type into the chat, how many letters could you remember? Amazing, isn't it? You can remember all 23 letters, right? That is the power of chunking. So if you can put information together and reduce it to smaller patterns, chunks you'll remember it and that's a great observation there yeah if you put it as a sentence it's easier to remember and we're going to use the power of that idea in a moment so that's a fantastic observation well done so it's exactly the same 23 letters but the difference is this time i reduced the 23 letters into five words five chunks study your degree at some way and yet, Tamzid, that's a great, great observation. You remembered them because the words made sense. 23 letters don't make sense, but five words do. So how do we maximize our short-term memory? Well, the first thing is focus your attention, minimize distractions. Do not play music. Do not even have your phone anywhere near you. Switch it off and put it in a drawer, put it in a bag, put it in a cupboard. Make sure your door is closed. Make sure everybody around you knows you are studying. Don't overload your short-term memory. Don't try and learn too much in one go. So try, if you can, to chunk things, combine smaller chunks into larger chunks. This is where techniques like mind mapping can be really useful because what you do is you link a series of unconnected ideas into a single picture. So what about your long-term memory? If you're organizing memory correctly in the short term, how do you get it into your long-term memory? So we're gonna do a test of long-term memory now. So I'm gonna show you a series of words on screen. Again, I want you to read those words to yourself silently. When the list has finished, I'm going to show you a series of numbers on the screen. And I want you to say those numbers out loud with me. Then when we finished saying the numbers, I want you to write down as many words as you can remember. Why not type them into the chat? So are we ready? So let's focus. Eighty, seventy-six, seventy-two, sixty-eight, sixty-four, sixty, fifty-six. Okay, write down as many words as you can remember. Okay, mathematics, elephant, lamp, thoughtful, yeah, great. Okay, so most people, you're good, aren't you? You guys are getting about five, four or five of the words. Yeah, that's really good. Okay, so we're going to do a similar exercise. Again, I'm going to show you a series of words. I want you to read the words silently, but I want you to think how useful those words would be to you if you were on holiday or vacation. So if you were taking a rest, 
How useful would those words be to you? When the list is finished again, we're going to display a series of numbers. And again, I want you to say the numbers out loud with me. When the numbers are finished, I want you to write down as many of the words as you can remember or type them into the chat. So are we focused and ready? Okay, let's begin. Forty, thirty six, thirty two, twenty eight, twenty four, twenty, sixteen. So write down as many words as you can remember. Wow, the chat's going mad. Oh, fantastic. So we're getting five, six. Anybody going to get all of the words? Yeah, umbrella table. But wow, fantastic. Quite a lot of people are getting all of the words. So let's see how well you did. So here's the first list. So as you can see, there are seven words here, which is roughly the capacity of your short term memory. So I didn't overload your short term memory, but how many of those words went into your long-term memory. Then, of course, the second list. And I'm just looking at the chat. It's very obvious that more of you remembered more words from the second list than from the first list. So typing into the chat, what was different about the two lists? What was different? What was obviously different about the two lists? Yeah, so the second one, I showed pictures and I gave you a situation, well spotted, right? And it's interesting, somebody here said it's all about the sea and the beach. Um, that actually isn't the situation I gave you, but it's the situation that works for you. I talked about holidays or vacations, all right? But you're right, these are the things that would help you on a beach holiday or a summer holiday. And I showed you pictures. So how does this relate to your memory? Well, the first thing is, as somebody said earlier, use context. So if you can put ideas into a sentence, if you can turn them into a bigger chunk, you are much, much more likely to remember them. So use the hotel sun umbrella conjures up the idea of holiday. And once you're thinking about holidays or vacations or beaches or summer, it's much easier to remember these two words together in a sentence. Of course, what I also did was I used visual images. So in this piece of research done a long time ago in 1970, you can see on the left, the people who just repeat the words boat tree, boat tree, boat tree, remember things a lot less than people on the right who thought of a picture of a boat in a tree. And what's amazing about a boat in a tree is, of course, that's a very unusual picture. And because it's unusual, you're much more likely to remember it. So actually, out of today, probably the things you'll remember in the long term are the boat in the tree and the elephant with the wrong number of legs. I'll talk about why in just a moment. Try and make the conditions in which you try and remember or encode something and remember or retrieve something the same. So if you're going to be doing an exam, study without noise. OK, in fact, if you really want to make it accurate, if you're studying for an exam, make sure you're sitting on an uncomfortable chair with a table that's a little bit too small that wobbles a bit and have somebody like me walking around, occasionally looking over your shoulder going, or <laughs> just like a real exam, 
and you're much more likely to remember. If you're trying to study in an environment that's noisy, where you're being distracted, you will find it very, very difficult to remember. Emotional arousal. So be happy, be excited. When you're trying to remember something, be interested. That's why the picture of a boat in a tree is much easier to remember because it arouses your emotions. It makes you question, it makes you think, well, would that really happen? So if you're happy and positive and you approach trying to remember something in a positive way, you're much, much more likely to remember it. And then make it personal. So I said, when we were gonna think about the second list, I mentioned vacations, I mentioned holidays. But some of you thought of summer and beach. So you made those things personal to you. And if you can make something personal to you, you are much, much more likely to remember it. So, chunk things, use pictures, do it when you're focused and it's quiet, be happy about it and make it personal to you and you are much, much more likely to remember it. So let's come back to the questions I asked you at the beginning. So what is more powerful, seeing or believing? Anybody want to tell me in the chat? What's more powerful? Well, it's interesting. We have a division of opinions. Um, seeing, obviously, says someone. Um, that's wonderful. But it, obviously, it's not always obvious. Um, and my guess is you will remember the elephant with the multiple legs. Right? Which means next time somebody gives you a question like, how many legs does an elephant have? You'll remember that maybe what you think you know, what you think you remember, is not necessarily what's actually true. So how far can you trust your memory? Could any of you remember what you were doing on June the 4th, 2019? Probably not till I showed you this picture. So there's an excellent comment there in the chat. If you believe and relate things, you can remember them better, right? So if you can relate things to stuff that's important to you, then you can begin to trust your memory because it's relevant to you. So can you focus your attention? Of course you can. But this, oh, that's fantastic there. Praise has said, 4th of June, my brother came home, right? Now that's a really personal and relevant event. So you're much, much more likely to remember that. It's like knowing your birthday. You all know what day your birthday is, right? So you're much more likely to remember it. The things that happen on that day, you're much more likely to remember. So focus your attention. You must learn to focus. You must learn to filter out distractions because the more distractions that are, are around you, the much harder you will find it to remember them. So how much can your memory hold? Believe me, it's very small. It's only seven plus or minus two things. So normally between five and nine chunks. Most people, it's around about six or seven. And we've seen the limits today of your own memory. But we've also found that if you can take lots of things and reduce them to a few things, if you can chunk them, you can easily remember 23 letters. Study your degree at Sunway. You can remember all 23 letters because I reduced it to five words that you could understand. And of course, if you use all these ideas together, context, put things into sentences, put them into a frame of reference, an idea, whether it's summer or beach or holiday or vacation, and make them relevant to you, you are much, much more likely to remember them. So I'm going to pause there. 
And there were lots of hands up at the beginning. So let's go to Q&A now. And if there are any questions you'd like to ask me, I'd be more than happy to deal with them. So you can either type into the chat or you can speak to me. The choice is yours. So hopefully you can all see me. I can see Apple on screen at the moment. So anybody got any questions? Okay, so I see Aaron has a question. Okay, so our brain likes to focus on one basic thing. Why is that so? Right, so think back millions of years. Okay, you'll think, what millions of years? I know you weren't alive. Even I, even I was not alive. I know I look old enough to be alive millions of years ago, but I wasn't. But imagine now early humans walking about on the savanna, that's the big grassy plains of Africa, and suddenly behind you, is a saber-toothed tiger. Now, it's really very useful if you can focus on that saber-toothed tiger immediately and focus completely on it. Because if you make the wrong decision, you're in trouble. Let me just give you an example of that, right? So if you miss having your lunch, you go a little bit hungry. If you become a saber-toothed tiger's lunch, that's game over. So it's really important that you can focus on important things entirely. So we evolved a brain that can only cope with one thing at a time. So if anybody tells you that there's something like multitasking, it's simply not true. You can actually test this yourself, and I do another presentation on this. If you're trying to do two things at once, what you're actually doing is switching between the two things. You're focusing your attention. So. For example, try and sit down now and write your name while reading what's on your handphone at the same time. Just try it, right? So just write your name, which is something that's really easy, while reading a WhatsApp message. Do it at exactly the same time. I guarantee you can't do it. You are biologically programmed to focus on one thing at a time. So make sure when you're trying to learn something, focus. So question, should multitasking be encouraged or should focus on single tasks, items be encouraged? As I just said, there is no such thing as multitasking. It's untrue, it's a myth, it's never existed, right? And in fact, the biggest cause of accidents, for example, amongst car drivers, over 80% of accidents are caused by inattention, by lack of focus. And that lack of focus could be caused by your handphone or just talking to the person next to you, right? So focus, focus, focus. Now, if you like, the easiest way to focus is to do it in short bursts. So most of us can focus for about 20 minutes. So if you're studying, focus really hard for 20 minutes, then give yourself a reward, five or 10 minutes to do something else. I feel overwhelmed and want to study from 15 different resources, which consumes a lot of time. What to do? Well, I don't know, uh, Tamsid, what the 15 different resources are, but think carefully about what it is you actually want to learn, right? In the modern world, there is just so much information out there. It's so easy to spend all our time looking at different things. Think about your questions. So at the beginning, you noticed I asked questions. So one of the best things you can do to remember or to study is to start with questions. So sit down before you look at anything and say, okay, what do I want to know by the end of this study period? What are my questions? And write your questions down. Then go to the resource that answers those questions. And as soon as you've answered the question, leave that resource and go to the next one. That's the best way to handle lots of different resources. Also learn to speed read. I do talks on speed reading. In most written resources, the information you need is in the first line of the paragraph or the last line. So check the first line, check the last line. If it's not relevant, move on to the next paragraph. Don't waste your time reading everything in between. Why can't we remember five chunks? If that's the minimum of our short-term memory, sometimes we see a person come back and don't remember their face, what they were wearing or anything else. 
Most of the time, we don't even remember what exact road we were on. We just remember the place. In fact, many of us don't even remember the place. But it's a really good question, Adya. And the reason is because we don't really pay attention. There is a theory that we remember everything. Um, there's also a theory that we forget everything because if we remembered everything, our brains would fill up. If any of you have ever read Sherlock Holmes, there's a wonderful scene with him and Dr. Watson when he actually says, I won't remember that, Dr. Watson. And Watson says, well, why Holmes? And he says, my brain is like an attic. I can only store so much rubbish in it, <laughs> right? So I don't bother remembering things I don't need to know. But actually the reason we tend to forget is simply we don't pay attention, right? And we don't make it relevant. So we forget people's faces because we don't make them relevant. If they're important to us, we tend to remember people's faces. So if you want to remember somebody's face and name, make it relevant to you or make it in some way emotionally interesting, right? So I shouldn't say this, but <laughs> one of the best ways to remember somebody's face is to imagine if they were wearing no clothes, okay? Your brain will go boof and you'll remember that person's name and that face. May not be a good memory initially, but you will remember it because you've created a really interesting visual image. Or imagine them in a bit of a silly situation, right? And then again, you're much more likely to remember them. So make it emotionally relevant to you. You're much more likely to remember them. So how do you increase your observational skill? Actually through practice. And again, I talk a lot about this. So there is a difference between seeing and looking. So when you look at something, what's actually there? How often do you ask yourself? So one of the wonderful things to do, if you've got some time, is just to sit in a public space and watch what's going on around you. But actually try to look. Don't just let it go past you, observe. So what are people wearing? What are people carrying? Who is talking to whom? What are they saying? What is their facial expression? What's their body language? Can you guess what they're saying to each other and what they mean, right? Now that teaches you how to observe. You can also, of course, play little games. There's a famous one in the book, Kim, if you've ever read it, where the teacher brings out a lot of objects on a tray just like I showed you things for a very short time, covers them up and then says to Kim, how many things were there on the tray? What were they? So you can practice this. So the only way to focus on a thing deeply despite distractions is putting to get rid of the distractions. And all the distractions in life are actually caused by you. So if you're gonna try and study, my advice is do not go and do it in the middle of the market. That's a pretty noisy place. It's a hot and a dusty place full of people. Much better to go to the library and sit quietly. Put on some headphones. Don't play yourself music. I'll come to that question in a moment. And focus on what you're doing. Put your phone away. The biggest distraction for young people is phones. And remember, if you're sending your friends pointless messages, you are now their biggest distraction. I'll let you into a secret. Listen, I don't care what you had for breakfast. Don't send me a picture. Because when I get 500 pictures of breakfast a day, do you know what? You've distracted me. So think very carefully. I do another whole talk about social media. Right? Be very careful about how you use social media. Do not let it take over your life and don't use it to take over anybody else's life. So I said music doesn't help us study better or help us focus more. But then why is it that my friend somehow focuses more by listening to music and also gets a good result by this? I would say, put in that your friend does better because they study harder. So another top tip here, right? You know lots of people who, as they, they leave the exam, will say, well, I didn't do any work at all, and I hope I've done okay. And you know those people have been working 25 hours a day for the past six weeks. 
They're lying to you, right? They're not telling you the truth. The truth in life is all the good things worth having are hard. That's why they're worth having. Because if they were easy, everybody would have them. Yeah? If they started giving away gold bars on the street corner this afternoon, how much do you think gold would be worth by tomorrow? Hmm. If they started giving away A grades this afternoon, how much do you think A grades would be worth by this evening? So, actually, I suspect your friend isn't telling you the truth. Your friend is working very hard and very focused to get those good grades. And if you do that too, you will get the good grades. And if you do some of the things I've talked about, you'll find it easier, right? And the thing is, it's like observation. If you practice, you find it easier. If you learn things every day, you find it easier to learn new things. And in fact, the more things I'll be talking tomorrow to some kids in Borneo about general knowledge. So the more things you know, two things happen. Firstly, the more you know you don't know. And secondly, the easier you find it to learn new things. Because the more general knowledge you have, the bigger the number of things you can relate ideas to. So things become more relevant because you already know other things, okay? So focus, 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 and try and learn something every day. So yeah. if we focus on remembering things, we do remember five chunks. But if we just go on with our work, we don't remember much. Well, Ajahn, there's a top tip there, isn't there? <laughs> right? I said don't overload your short-term memory. So give yourself 20 minutes of focus, then give yourself a break. Use the power of questions. So again, one of the great things you can do is use questions to review. So at the beginning, I ask myself questions. What do I want to learn? I then learn it. I give myself a break. Then I go back to those questions and ask myself again. And then I try and answer them. Right? And because I'm trying to answer them, I'm actually making my brain work harder, my memory work harder. And by trying to retrieve things, that's the technical term, I'm actually making those things get deeper into my brain. So the more times you ret retrieve things, the more likely you are to remember them. Now we call this spaced repetition. So if you practice and you practice lots and often, you're much more likely to remember. So if you want to learn to play the piano, don't sit down and spend two hours playing the piano. Play the piano, play the piano 20 minutes a day, three times a day four times a week. And you'll be a much better pianist in two weeks than if you practice for the same number of hours in two big blocks. Okay, I see there we're running full for registrations. Okay, well, as I've said, I'm happy to come back and do this again. I'm happy to come back and talk to you about study. I'm happy to come back and talk to you about any number of things, because you know what? You are the most interesting thing in the world, but there's only three people in the world who are interested in you. Do you know who the three people in the world who are interested in you are? You, your mum, and me, right? We're the only three people who are interested in you, but you are, believe me, the most interesting person in the world. Prof. Hi, Prof. Yes, Apple. I have four interesting questions on Facebook. Okay. I read these questions um, from the lady. Um, how does various time of a day affect the power of our memorizing? Okay, that's a really good question. So I bet most of you here in the meeting today find it really hard to get up early in the morning. Yeah, you would much rather, rather get up at 10 o'clock in the morning. And of course, because we adults are such nice people, we make you get up at half past six in the morning to go to school, right? Now, the truth is that 80% of people are what we call night owls. They work best at night. So their most productive time is between five and seven in the evening, which is just the time that normally your parents make you eat your dinner. And of course, as soon as you eat dinner, particularly rice or bread, so, you know, roti nasi are really bad for you, lots of sugar, you want to go to sleep. Because actually that's your body again. 
right? Three million years ago, when you have a good meal, you go to sleep, you store it as fat. So find which time of day works best for you. If you're one of the 20% early morning people, then do your hard work in the early morning. If you're one of the 80% people who work better in the evening, do your studying and your revision in the evening. And particularly in the month or so before exams, tell mum and dad, look, I need my time now to do my studying and my revision. But then when you've told them, make sure you do it, right? Don't cheat. And remember, if it's worth having in life, it's hard. But doing stuff that's hard for a month is nothing. Most of you people are going to live over 100 years. What's, what's four weeks of hard work? It's nothing. But make sure you do it. Apple, another question. Yes, um, I have something that they have been discussing on Facebook. Many students do a lot of study before exam night. Is this right to memorize things? Uh, the short answer is no. We've all done it. I've done it. Um, I can remember the night before the exam trying to learn absolutely everything. But there is so much you simply overload your memory. Now, if you're really lucky, some of the stuff you remember will come up on the exam. If you're really unlucky, you'll have forgotten the stuff that comes up on the exam. It's always much better to start and plan earlier. And I do a whole series of talks on how to pass exams. But the general advice is the earlier you start your revision, the better you will do. And of course, a top tip through life. I'm clearly old. You just look at the picture here. You're amazed, aren't you? I can still keep going. So I tend to forget things, which means in the morning I get up and at the foot of my bed, I have a big sign that has my name on it. So I remember it. No, I'm only kidding. Right? But I've learned through life important things I remember by refreshing. Yeah. So I like to learn languages. And the best way is, of course, to learn languages in sentences, but to refresh those sentences and to make them relevant. Right. So if you're trying to learn, for example, English, most of the language courses will teach you in the first lesson about how to name the members of your family. And in the second lesson, there'll be things like how to go to the shops. Well, when was the last time you went with your cousin to the shops to buy a melon? Probably never. So much better it would be for you to study language that's relevant to you, right? So why not find other pen pals or people online who speak English and talk to them about the things you're interested in? Your language will improve quickly because it's relevant to you. It will be chunked into sentences and you can ask somebody, what did that mean? And once you understand four words in a sentence, it's very easy to add the fifth. Apple, any more questions? Oh, there are plenty of questions on Facebook. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, so um, just to, I think um, what I can do is just to do a summarization. A lot of students have been asking, um, it's difficult to get uh, concentrates from, uh, I mean, to study while the cell phones keep distracting um, and they, they do not know how to get rid of these kind of addictions on the social media, on the phones. And there goes, it kind of impacts the way how they study um, how effective they can study. I think those are the questions been asking on Facebook. Yeah, the, the, the worst thing in, and the most wonderful thing that's happened in my lifetime is the mobile phone. Okay, it's an amazing computer in your pocket. Uh, when I was your age and I first went out to work, um, I worked for a big multinational. Um, and I worked as an office junior um, and their computer took up a building almost as big as the university I'm sitting in. Right? It was huge, and it couldn't even do the basic things your mobile phone does. So they're an amazing gift, but they are also the biggest curse that was ever invented. Right, And if you allow them to take over your life, they will do. You need to learn to manage your phone. Most important thing is switch it off at night. Right, Don't take messages at 2 o'clock in the morning. Don't let people wake you up. And even worse, don't you send messages to other people at two in the morning, right? There is no message that is so important that you need to look at it now. Trust me, trust me. If the building is on fire, nobody will send you a WhatsApp. You don't need to look at it now, right? So learn to switch your phone off 
and put it away. You'll find it difficult, I know, for the first couple of days. We've done some research here that shows if you can't see your phone, your anxiety level goes up by about 10% because you're worried you might miss something important like what your friend didn't have for breakfast this morning, right? But the truth is you need to switch it off and put it away. Otherwise, it will disturb your thinking, it will disturb your focus, and you'll find it much harder to learn. There is some evidence that your younger generation are having more accidents because you're spending too much time on your mobile phone. So you're not paying attention to the world around you, which means you're falling off things or walking in front of cars. So I'm deadly serious. Learn to manage your mobile phone. It has much more benefits. And again, I do a Thank whole lot <laughs> Um, okay, there are really lots of questions. Um, I want to pick one of the questions. They were asking about how to control emotions. I believe it's um, because everyone put on a lot of efforts to learn. They try their best to memorize. But sometimes, you know, the result can might not turn out the way they want. Is there any tips that can help them to, you know, to kind of control their emotions and then um, it will help them to be able to pick up and continue their learning? Oh, there are an awful lot, but that is, a, in fact, another whole talk in itself, emotional self-management. Now, don't worry. Most of the people in this room, you're young people, you're teenagers, okay? Um, and this is the, the time of your life when you're discovering who you are. Now, my biggest piece of advice to young people is be who you want to be. Don't just be, right? You can make conscious choices about who you want to be and how you live your life. And the way you do this is by thinking, thinking. Now, emotions are really important and they're a wonderful part of being a human. But what makes us different to the animals is that we think. Right? So we have the choice. So before you act, before you let your emotions run away, think, is this really important? Right? If I got this wrong, can I fix it? Can I make it right? And 99% of the time, yes, you can. Right? So, all right, this exam didn't go well. Okay, fine. On to the next one. I can do really well next time. And don't see it as failure, see it as an opportunity to learn. So think, why did this exam not go well? What could I have done better? What could I have improved? What have I learned from what I didn't do? What will I do right next time? And if you start thinking of the world like that, then in the end, nothing can upset you because you realize the choice, the power is with you. You make the decisions about what upsets you and what doesn't. And if you decide something's not important, it won't upset you. So don't let it. Thank you, Prof. Very interesting answers. <laughs> yeah, because um, I believe some of the students have been quite constant. You know, sometimes um, they, have, they have really did their best. They have tried to memorize, they try to learn, okay, and somehow before the exam, they kind of panic and they do not know what to do. So that was that was what they were well, asking I, for. I tell you what, Apple, if it will be helpful and any co willing, I'd be delighted to come back and talk to you closer to exam time about how to do well in your exams and some of the tips that you can use um, to not only increase your memory, but manage your emotions, yeah? yeah and of I course, think... make you, your mum and me very happy with exam success. Yeah. I think Tusha can do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I think for Facebook, um, we have more or less covered most of the questions. Okay, um, I think back to the Zoom. Some, there are quite a few of the students has been asking, is there anything that they can invest in terms of their hobby? Okay, other than just playing device. Prof, what do you do at, during your free time? Ah, uh, well, actually, I do a lot of things. I play the piano very badly. Um, I paint very badly. I draw even worse. I read books. Um, I love to go to the arts. And again, that's another key thing I talk about, the arts. Now, I'm a scientist by training, right? So science is what understands life. Art is what makes life worth living, 
right? So I would say probably the best thing, the easiest thing you can do is sit down with older people and listen to them, ask them questions. They will tell you the great stories of their lives. They'll tell you the great stories of the country and the nation and the history and lots of other interesting things. Read interesting books, go to plays. Think about the classic literature, the classic art of your own culture. The reason it's classic is because it tells you something about you. So do you know what? Going to an art gallery is actually quite a good thing to do. So why not spend this Saturday afternoon doing that? You never know, you might learn something. You might meet somebody interesting. And the other good thing is, and I shouldn't say this either, but for young people, um, normally the kinds of other young people you meet in places like art galleries or libraries or bookshops, the kind of interesting people you probably want to get to know better. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, I think um, what else? There, why is that we can visualize carriers incidents while dreaming up, but forget most of the dream incident as soon as we wake up? Is it relatable to our memory? Okay, so dreaming is a really interesting topic. Um, we don't really know what dreaming is and why it happens. The most widely held theory is that dreaming is concerned with processing the memories of the day. Uh, what we do know about memory um, is that initially memories are laid down uh, in a couple of organs at the very center of the brain called the hippocampi. Uh, hippo, you might remember this now, hippo means um, horse in Greek, right? So hippocampi means seahorses. Um, hippopotamus means river horses, though a hippopotamus looks nothing like a, a horse. But um, what we know is that those initial memories are almost um, perfect in the sense that you remember the picture, you remember the emotion, the feeling. But over time, those memories are processed and they move to the top of the brain, the area of the brain that we call the cortex. And when they move into the cortex, they become words. They become about meanings. They become what we call semantics. So we think that possibly dreaming is about transferring memories from emotions and pictures into words. And there's a really good piece of evidence for this. Think about your emotions again. If something really upsets you today, you'll remember it. It's very powerful. Think about something that upset you a year ago. You can probably remember it, but you don't remember the feeling. So it's significant and important to you and you remember it, but you don't remember the feeling. You don't feel angry anymore. Right? So that would seem to indicate that your emotions have somehow been replaced in memory by meaning. And that's why virtually every culture has some kind of proverb along the lines of time is a great healer. Because over time, what happens is we forget emotion. We just remember meanings. And maybe that's what's happening when we dream. But as yet, we don't know. Yeah, because for, for I think for a lot of people, um, we kind of think whatever that I learned, will I be dreaming it at night? I think that's going to be a whole new topic that we can cover. <laughs> it is so, a whole new topic. And we don't yeah. know. Possibly, yes, you are. I think uh, we, I can pick up one last question. Uh, I'm not too sure if Shamin is, um, maybe it could be a teacher. She asks, how can I make students more attentive in class? Ah, no, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> wow, I do quite have... a bit of stuff for teachers as well about various ways that we can approach tasks. I guess the best way to make students attentive, several very quick top tips. Um, start with questions. Um, questions will get them thinking. Use regular questions throughout your sessions. Don't make your sessions too long. And move between topics, but clearly link the topics. So if you're teaching for an hour or two, put in some breaks, um, but talk about something else. It doesn't mean they need to go outside and have a drink or a rest, just move to a different topic and ask a set of new questions. And that way, brains are thinking about new scenarios, new ideas, and they come alert again. So as I said earlier in, in this chat, 20 minutes is normally about the most that anybody can focus for. 
So by now, I know you've all gone to sleep because I've been talking for about 40 minutes. Okay, so if you're still paying attention, thank you very much. And yet up to this moment, we have still recorded like full attendance. So no one leave from the chat rooms from the start of the sessions until now. And we have recorded close to 200 students on Facebook as well. So it's a very, very interesting session. I'm so thankful Prof you today with us. And um, of course, there are coming more and more questions and I do not know where to focus as well from Facebook, from Zoom. And um, I think uh, we will be able to share another round of sessions if time permits, um, I will discuss with um, our partners. And um, I would say thank you so much for paying attention today. And because I have since the participants list from hundreds from the start that we had until now it's still hundreds. And Facebook will record a very, very high attendance. Really, thank you so much for paying attention today. Thank you so much for having Prof Yu here with us. If you all have any questions, you can always come us, okay, um, to Samo University. And of course, you can also contact our partner um, from Edico Pathway, Tusha. Should I hand over the floor back to you? Sure, thank you so much. Uh, uh, it was a fantastic session, uh, Professor. Uh, you, you have no idea how much people are commenting on Facebook, on our Zoom. A lot of people are just waiting who couldn't join the session. So we would love to have another session, uh, maybe very soon uh, from you. Uh, it, it was fantastic. I'd also like to thank, uh, take this opportunity to thank Apple and the entire Sunway University team who have been able to manage something like this for uh, our teachers, our students, uh, for our community here. Uh, it was a great session. Uh, so uh, uh, without further ado, uh, just a little uh, notice to everyone who's uh, waiting to get their uh, hands on to fill up the form. It's on our Facebook page. Please look at our comments. There should be a form there. You need to fill this up. It's uh, not a giveaway certificate you have to uh, understand and give some sort of an answer of what this whole session was about this amazing session was about so you'll find that form there um, i have also put that down in the comment section here as well as you can see right now in the comment section so please do not forget to fill up this form and for the next session we will definitely have another quick session very soon from i hope professor you will join us again uh, with uh, another interesting topic. So uh, like our page, uh, follow our page uh, for any updates from Sunway University and Professor Hugh Gill's next session. Um, with that, I would like to stop uh, the streaming from Facebook. Thank you all for who, whoever have joined in the session.